We are live. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Tony Shirota, the Executive Director of the Reverse Logistics Association. And we are very excited about today's webinar, Robotics in Reverse Logistics. Uh, in, so we're going to get started as soon as Tony figures out and remembers how to share the screen and go to the PowerPoint deck and bring it up for everyone to recognize and to see and we're live. Okay, so today is robotics and I believe the screen is showing for everyone. I Robotics in reverse logistics. This one uh, is, oh, it's not there yet. Let's make sure it's there. Great, I think that makes it work. Okay, we do wanna acknowledge right away from the start, um, uh, thank you to our sponsors. In this case, uh, Cisco is not only uh, the event sponsor by providing WebEx events, uh, they are also one of our board member companies and have been very supportive of the Reverse Logistics Association for many years now. So um, with that said, we'll move to the next slide, which let's talk a little bit about the Reverse Logistics Association. This is the global association for the reverse and returns industry. It is member focused. We focus on events. We focus on industry committees. We focus on a directory, a magazine, a newsletter. If you are a third party service partner or solutions provider, you should be in our directory, which is both in print in partnership with DC Velocity and online. We are the only global association, the only association where you can find over 600 companies in the circular economy resources area with returns, resell, repair, recycling, and resources. We're very proud of that directory. It's live all the time. And we also are proud of our partnership with DC Velocity because they printed and send it out to over 50,000 subscribers worldwide. I do wanna take a moment and mention RLA Connect, which is really RLA outsourcing. It is an anonymous opportunity for retailers and manufacturers and even some third-party service providers to reach out for a specific project, specific work they need done and receive responses from the global community. And we've done this successfully for years. We are expanding it in the next year and uh, make it even more interactive. Upcoming events. We're proud to be associated with uh, Supply Chain Now, which does live stream events on LinkedIn, Facebook, and other social media. Uh, Supply Chain Now with our friends Scott Luton and Greg White uh, have a reverse logistics monthly series. Uh, once a month, they talk to generally a practitioner uh, industry leading voices, and there are sponsorship uh, opportunities available with them, and they have literally hundreds of thousands of impressions. Our webinar today, for example, we do have hundreds of registrations for these uh, webinars generally on a monthly basis, and we're very proud of, of the community's engagement, and we are already planning our next webinar, which will be Wednesday, May 3rd, again at 12 noon Eastern. And there will be sponsorship available for that. But also I'd like to mention that there will be, uh, the webinar will be focused on women in reverse logistics. Uh, we expect to have um, Walgreens participate, uh, as well as Logitech and other companies. So that's our continuation of webinars for May, and we'll have one in June, take a break in July and come back. The upcoming events, of course, these are RLA at events. Uh, being the voice of the industry, we are asked to participate in many events, and I'm proud that I am no longer the only voice of the RLA or the industry. Uh, I will be at Deliver in Amsterdam, June 7th and 8th. Uh, Nelly Ramirez on our team, a volunteer, for us will participate at Mobile Disrupt in Las Vegas. Kathy Robertson, 
who doubles as our research manager and spokesperson, will be at Home Delivery World in Philadelphia, June 14th and 15th. That event is free to attend. And then June 26th to 28th, Kathy will again be at SMC3 in Orlando uh, and, and speaking about the last mile and the last reverse mile. In addition, uh, the annual conference and expo we just uh, finished, of course, Las Vegas in February, but we have already begun to post for next year. Uh, next year's event will be back in Las Vegas, so there will be registration exhibiting sponsorship opportunities now online. But more important, we are proud to be going back to Europe, to Amsterdam, for what we're calling this year the EMEA Summit, which stands, of course, for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And we know we will have attendees from all of those regions in Amsterdam for approximately two days on a Tuesday, Wednesday. Very proud to tell everyone that our keynote speaker is Tom Marr, uh, Senior Vice President of Dell in the aftermarket service, global service supports uh, area. And uh, Tom's been with the RLA since uh, way back around 2009. And he's been a, he a huge supporter and an advisory board member that I'm very proud to, to have and to know. Our leadership summit will be repeated this time, September 6th, 7th at Georgia Tech Conference Center and hotel in Atlanta. The leadership summit is reserved for the higher level members, silver and above. And it is a no expo, no advertising event. It's networking, but it's also dinner with the board on the evening of the sixth, dinner and a reception. So we know that will be an important event. And on Thursday, it will include uh, uh, facility tours, including the Home Depot's facility returns processing in McDonough, Georgia, just south of Atlanta. Finally, we do, as we said, uh, the 2024 RLA Conference and Expo, we will go back to Las Vegas, again to the Mirage Hotel, which may be called the Hard Rock by then, uh, but approximately the same dates, the first week of February 6th, 7th, and 8th. A member benefit, a strong one, are the RLA committee meetings. As a member, you're entitled to participate in each and every one. The focus is generally a speaker who talks about this particular niche of the reverse logistics world, such as service parts and warranty, wireless mobility, consumer products, recycling and sustainability. I will mention that our standards committee uh, is actually tomorrow, that date is wrong. It's uh, tomorrow at 12 noon, the standards committee and the European committee uh, will be later this month. Again, we focus on the community, uh, the, the third party service providers who have solutions that they wanna share with the community and we're very proud to highlight those. I do want to mention the returns index survey. This will pop up on your screen when you when we close the webinar. Please consider taking a moment to do the survey monkey for the returns index for quarter two is now open. In addition, you'll see a short survey with a couple of questions uh, about Las Vegas, about speakers, about these webinars, et cetera. All right, today's panel again, Robot Robotics in Reverse Logistics. I'll be your host for today. I'm proud to have with us Sean O'Farrell from Tompkin Robotics, Georg Weber of Opto Fidelity, uh, and Rupert Kaczynski of Rax Industries. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. But first, the reason we're doing this today is to understand how, we know the why, but how do robotics help the massive amounts of returns, for example, pictured here. And everyone has, if you haven't seen one of these facilities and what these things look like, you look at that and say, how can we make that process go faster and more efficiently? And we will start here uh, with Sean. I'll let you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and then Georg and Rupert. Sean, go ahead. Great. Uh, thank you, Tony, and thank you for the introduction. I uh, appreciate that. I. Uh... I find reverse logistics becoming near and dear to my heart when you see images like that with the, uh, the cluttered warehouses. And we're seeing it everywhere uh, with everybody being compressed for time and uh, just managing a number of different things. Uh, I, I'm with Top Into Robotics. I'm a vice president of operations. I've been with the company for 16 months now, but I've been in the industry 
uh, other material handling supply chain industry for 30 plus years, and uh, they have a lot of uh, experience with uh, the ergonomics or fulfillment, but uh, the sortation solutions that are needed for um, customers that don't have automation, customers that have it, but they become more efficient. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Tony. Great. Thank you, Sean. And I, and I love the image in the background, the little robots running around. We're going to yeah, talk uh, more about those. <laughs> the, um, no, uh, Sean, we know those are your robots, and, and, uh, and, and we're proud that you had them in Las Vegas with us. And of course, Tompkins Robotics was selected as the best booth uh, there in Las Vegas by the RLA Advisory Board members. So uh, uh, congratulations yeah, on that. That was our T-Sort mini robot, uh, just to kind of uh, convey the, the image of what the sortation could look like, depending on what your, your product size is being handled. Uh, the video running in the background is a shot from our lab here in Orlando, which is about five minutes north of the airport. People are invited to come visit the lab anytime they want, or even send product in to have it tested. We have a lot of customers, potential customers, that do that sitting in Orlando oh. testing. I guess the minis in Las Vegas were really cute, and the board loved them. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Pick one of your favorite color next year and, and your name on it, Tony. That sounds good. Thank you, Sean. Um, Georg, um, I'll let you talk about Opto Fidelity and yourself for a few minutes, couple minutes here. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Yeah, my name is uh, Georg Weber. I'm uh, with Opto Fidelity since five years. Um, we are a company based in Finland and uh, specialize on robotics that help uh, in a circular economy. Uh, our robots can be used um, uh, in your triage process to sort the goods from, from the bad uh, devices. Uh, currently, we're specializing on, on smartphones. That's where we see the, uh, 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 the, the, the easiest entry into, the, into the, the reverse logistics, but uh, we're planning to scale to other parts of uh, uh, the circular economy. Great. Thank you very much, Georg. Uh, Rupert, tell us about yourself and Rax, please. Right. Um, good. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm the president and the founder of Rax Industries, which has been going for about um, seven years. Um, we are active across the world, um, and we're now sort of looking much more closely at the whole area of reverse logistics. Um, and I'll be delighted to share with you further thoughts about that today. Wonderful, Rupert. Thank you. And Rupert, we're going to actually begin with you. Um, uh, it's very uh, focused on the fact that robots can help. And, and so that's really the first question. So uh, when I showed that picture of what the reverse logistics returns places look like, how can robots help reverse logistics, Rupert? Well, I think that in reverse logistics, um, ultimately, every item is unique because um, there are, you know, it, it's not just a standard product because it's been been used by someone else, and the the characteristics of that use um, have to be associated with that product. So um, this makes it much more important to, you know, be able to um, have single order processing, single item processing, and um, instead of batch processing. Um, which is, you know, um, which, which is more, um, uh, applicable to, to, um, normal sort of logistics. Um, with robotics, it's very easy to do, to identify unique items and to process them, um, uniquely so that you can, um, you can pick out exactly which item is required for exactly which, which, which customer. Okay. Well. Um, we'll start there, and Sean, let's let's move towards your side, because uh, again, Tompkins Ro Robotics also makes robots that move around a warehouse floors. So, how can that uh, reduce touches of return goods? Well, when you uh, if we start with that image of received product that is in a staging area and it's all over the place, you could bring a, a case or a pallet or a gateboard of product over to one of our induct stations. Uh, open up that plot, that case and start inducting items right away. Uh, a lot of times, uh, if, if you don't have to grade the items, uh, you know, a person could induct upwards to 1,500 items per hour. So you could quickly go through uh, a lot of that cubic product that you had staged in that image uh, to be sorted to the, the destinations. And 
and a lot of times in, in the returns, uh, uh, the reverse logistics that some of the companies that we're dealing with, they might have uh, sort of destinations like back to the retailer or the retail store, uh, or it might go into e-commerce where it might be sold on a website, or it might go to charity or recycle or wholesaler and other. Uh, so we help sort that, and it could go sorting into a number of different types of uh, sort receptacles like a tote or a day lord or a shoot or a repair, uh, or into a, a shipping cart if you want to ship it back out or put it into storage. So the, the intent is to reduce the touches. Uh, usually a couple are, are automation or a robot close to the received area. So uh, the, the key, Tony and, and uh, our listeners, is to try to get that back in the inventory as quick as possible so you reduce the cost of handling it but make it available for sale uh, right away and, and that's what we're trying to do with our solution sets and, and with our, our peers in the industry as well um and and sean those those are good points and 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 thanks we 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 sir we can kind of understand that the challenge of course is that the robots don't know if the product is good or not Right. Um, they only know what the uh, you know the sortation hands them, and then they do something with it, and all of that is is efficient and and great. But Georg, let's come to you and OptoFidelity because your robots and and your robotics help do something a little more than just move the goods, right? In terms of dispositioning. That's right. So uh, we're using like computer vision. And, and other tools uh, um, and combine them together to a robot or like a robotics um, uh, product. And uh, with that, that can, with that, we can do the triage. So incoming product gets evaluated by our robot. It looks at it, it, it touches it, it interacts uh, with the product and then finds the, the disposition. So uh, we can uh, uh, greatly reduce uh, the, the accuracy of that disposition finding uh, compared to uh, manual uh, labor right now where, where a human would have to look at it and then get tired over time or one human would do, uh, evaluate the product differently than another one. And so with the robotics, we're bringing in uh, a standard that can be enforced and, and the robot would uh, grade and uh, evaluate a uh, incoming product always the same. Um, and. Uh, yeah, that that that, that is uh, uh, also reducing the the touches uh, that we talked um, earlier, uh, because we can trust the the robot uh, more than uh, a human. With the human, we typically have to have a second layer like quality control to make sure uh, uh, the disposition is correct. With the uh, robotic processing. Uh, in the triage, uh, that can be greatly reduced um, to to fewer touches. And and Georg, um, certainly in in the case of dispositioning, and and what you're really talking about is is grading, just to a large degree. And and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of standards about grading in our industry. We, there's new, and there's everything else. <laughs> and um, and the grading that, that your machines would allow actually is to perhaps call it a grade A, grade B, based on the uh, the vision of the computer and, and what it determines, a uh, uh, number of scratches or, or rips or, or cosmetic blemishes, et cetera, right? That is one thing. Yes, or all of okay. what you just mentioned, we can do. And furthermore, we can also do functional testing of the device. Um, that is right now specifically for smartphones. So uh, we will test the microphone of the smartphone. We will test the speakers. We will test the camera, the display, the touch sensor, um, up to like 30 different sensors and components of the smartphones. Um, um, and that also goes into the disposition. Um, so if they ever go to uh, a resell, uh, they all of these components of the phone have to be in perfect condition. If any of those would be broken, then uh, the our customers they would uh, then route them differently. For example, right. using those uh, uh, cute robots, uh, they would then automatically go down a different path. Maybe get scrapped if the phone is, is broken uh, uh, or damaged severely, or maybe just individual components like the LCD screen 
uh, they can nowadays be replaced and, and the phone can be refurbished um, and then can go back into um, in, in, into the um, into stock. Into yeah. yeah. Um, so, Georg, um, thank you. And I want to come back to Rupert because uh, Rupert, one of the um, uh, associations I and maybe many others have with robots is they're expensive. <laughs> and, and it's expensive to convert a facility and have it uh, managed by robots and robots doing a lot of the reverse logistics work. Um, what sort of ROI can be expected um, in, in from robots and, and robotics? Is that is that something you can, well, can you speak to that just a little bit, Rupert? Yes, of course. So the starting point about robotics and the technology that's available today is that you can automate anything that you want to. Um, so the issue isn't, can I automate this process or not? Um, the issue is which part of the process does it make sense for me to automate? And that the answer on, you know, which part of the process to automate depends on, on many different factors. For example, how big your facility is, how much, um, how many items are being put through it. So what we do when we, um, you know, make contact with somebody who's interested in looking at the opportunity of automating uh, for reverse logistics, is the first thing we do is we analyze, we have a look together with 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 the the prospective customer um, where their costs are, where, which which part of the process um, are linked with which costs, and so we, we we can come up with different solutions for different you know configurations. So for example, you know I've just been into a very small facility earlier this morning. Um, they've only got a few people working there. But there's one part of their process which is labour intensive, and you know we can we can provide for that um, a a very good solution, um, which offers them for that part of their process you know, the standard ROI of requirement. Um, for a bigger facility where you might have you know literally hundreds of people working, then we can move towards a, a much more sophisticated um, solution. Which, um, for example, we're we're implementing um, a, in in Europe um, for the, what we believe is um, you know a, 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 the first fully automated warehouse um, for for this particular product, which includes um, you know packaging as well. So um, so we can go so, so just by doing this initial analysis, um, we will find that part of the operation where there is an ROI. And um, the, the ROI, by the way, conventionally, the starting point for most of these projects is to do an FTE based ROI. So we'll go in and the customer will always want to want, want to talk about how many heads he's going to save for that particular part of his operation. So the, the experience that we have is that, yes, of course, that's very important. And, you know, we will be able to find you the ROI that you r wish for um, in, you know, at least part of your operation. But um, once that solution has been implemented, what our customers always find is that there's, there's, there's a lot of other savings associated with, with this technology in terms of, um, you know, for example, uh, one frequent uh, issue is space. So, you know, um, this technology is very space efficient. These, um, so we can free up a lot of extra space in existing warehouses, which can then be used for, for other operations. So essentially, there, there's not a sort of simple answer to, um, to you know, what is the ROI going to be? The answer is, um, we can find you the RII that's needed, um, and for each of you, for each site, there will be a different um, there will be a different um, solution in place, which will be suited to your particular need. And, and Rupert, uh, you hit on two hugely important factors in reverse logistics. Um, one is uh, the full time employees, the FTEs that you spoke about. Um, and we don't have enough of them. I mean, everyone is saying there are not enough employees out there 
to run all of the return centers processing. In fact, we know anecdotal evidence of, of trailers and hundreds of trailers of return goods that haven't been processed that are sitting out in parking lots around the country or maybe around the world, of course. So one is you're talking about robots and robotics helping on that side, but you also mentioned another factor, um, the, the warehouse space that can be saved because of faster processing and, and more efficient processing. And that's another um, critical area for reverse logistics because some of our members who are in the warehousing industry are indicating there's, there's a severe shortage of warehouse space in, in many, many metropolitan areas where it's needed. So um, thank you for hitting on those two. And I'm gonna move over to Sean and let you kind of take it a step from there, Sean, and, and, and maybe talk about uh, 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 those factors and more when you're looking at an ROI for robotics. Uh, and, and by the way, um, Rupert, members who join these webinars, they like to hear numbers. And, and I understand the caution of that, but can you give any real examples? And I'm gonna ask Sean the same question of ROI timing wise. Is it something that can be as fast as six months or is it always gonna be like six years? Is there some range you can give? And I know it's a factor of the size and product types and so on, but everyone's gonna to wanna to know what what can I look at as a range for an ROI from your side, Rupert? Okay, so so typically the sort of customers we're dealing with, they, they'll want a, an ROI on FTE reduction um, of about three years. Okay. So, you know, and typically you. we, you know, that, that, that's the kind of benchmark that we're used okay. to working with and, and we'll be able to find that. Um, but um, what we've seen is that, you know, um, with certain sites, for example, stock reduction, there's a lot of working capital is, is tied up in stock. And you mentioned all these trailers. And stock, which is on the shelf, um, costs money and doesn't generate money. So the beauty of um, the technology that's available today is that we can reduce stocks and we can increase turnaround times. And so, you know, it's very possible to have incredibly short ROIs based just on that. I mean, if you think about how much some of these items cost, um, uh, if I can release it, if I can bring down my inventories, if I can increase my, 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 my you know, turnovers, um, then, then we're talking about very fast paybacks indeed. Thank you. That's very important to uh, to the members who are listening today. And Sean, let me come back to you and, and kind of throw it out there for thank, you. Thank you, Tony. And I think Rupert brought up some really, really valid points. And, and thank you for pointing out uh, the, the attendees would like to hear numbers. If we did a, you know, for any, I've been, again, doing this for 30 years, for any automation project, it's always focused on the FTEs first. You know, how can you uh, uh, reapply them at a different area of the warehouse or uh, if you can't find the labor, how does automation justify that? So it used to be replacing labor. Now it's say you can't find it. Uh, but a simple example is, let's say you have uh, an employee that's $40,000 a year burden. That's fully uh, a full burden rate where it has insurance in there. It has other things. Uh, and you, you take that and you have the training. You might even have a uniform. Uh, you might be paying for other things like uh, uh, travel or something like that. But at 40,000, if you could save five people with automation, with robots, whatever it might be, you might have $200,000 to work with. And if that customer allows a three-year payback, you might be talking about $600,000 to start with. So that's just the automation perspective or the FTE perspective. But when you take, take into account, a lot of companies have older infrastructure. They, they start out, you have a lot of family-owned companies, Tony, in your, your uh, organization in the association and with that uh, they may have never done automation before they don't know what to do and they're in space and they're successful and now they can't get beyond the space or they can't find the space uh, so the robots and uh, to to uh, Rupert's point if you can turn your cycle time if you can uh, you know reduce the amount of cycle time to process product coming in and getting it back out the door you should be able to turn and be able to grow with that, but you should be able to free up space. So uh, a lot of companies, the bigger companies, will take a justification on floor space savings or cost avoidance of either A, having to add on to the size of the building, uh, B, adding a, a third-party warehouse somewhere else, a satellite warehouse, 
uh, storage, whatever it might be, or even see building a brand new building. So if you can avoid that, prolong the the, uh, the the life of the building and your operation and everything you have in place, automation makes a good justification and play in that regard. Uh, I'm going to just take it two or three steps further. Uh, one, when you think about the product coming in, you know when you're receiving that product from retailers or other organizations, they're not neatly packing out those A lords or those cases or whatever they're, they're putting the return product into. They're basically filling it in there. When you think about automation, you might not think about the ability to keep the quality good and not degrade it. So uh, we're using robots, whether it's our, our TSO tray robot, a robotic arm, pick and place arm, other technologies. You have predictability, reliability, uh, you know, no cigarette breaks, uh, things like that. Does the call off on holidays? Uh, but the gentle handling of that product to make sure that you're able to keep the, the, the profit or the value up on that product. So I think that's very important. So that was one the one thing, the space savings. Um, uh, the other is just uh, the reliability and, and knowing what's going on. And the technology nowadays has come down to pricing uh, to the point that, uh, you know, the sophistication of the automation is not as great anymore either, that you don't need a maintenance department or if you do need a maintenance department, uh, you could potentially take away your your current operators and train them to be able to, to understand the automation and when to maintain it and how to do it and things like that. So that's that's pretty important for a lot of those uh, companies that may be smaller and don't can't afford engineering or can't afford a maintenance department. And and Sean, thank you for giving a little more uh, analysis on the numbers and and I I know people really appreciate that your example the forty thousand dollar year FT. And 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 let's under let's understand we most of us know that even if you use robotics, those FTEs who are putting things on a shelf where a robot can do it could be better used at the front line where they have to pull things out of those messy uh, Gaylords and and make a decision oh. there and do something with it. So um, you're short staffed everywhere. Why not take those employees, automate the shelving, and bring them to the front line where the value is first and Georg I'm going to come back to you because let's talk about that value at the front line where you can inspect and disposition a product uh, you can generally create an increase in yield over what you might have today by using robotics such as opto fidelity produces so why don't you speak to that yield changes and what can happen there Georg sure yeah, we, we actually conducted uh, two large scale studies with uh, 3POs uh, in both in the US and in, in Europe. Um, and uh, what we, we were actually measuring the, the, the yield um, uh, comp uh, of the manual processing line of the, the triage, the, uh, sorting the incoming product, and then compare that with our robotics kind of sorting um, of the product. Um, and, and we found both times pretty, uh, pretty amazingly that the uh, human sorting of the uh, product uh, w was only uh, a 60 percent accurate. So the yield was only 60 percent and there was a lot of wrong disposition. And then those had to be caught later on in, in a quality control process or they were just wrong. Uh, a wrongly disposition and then maybe send out to cut, uh, like a broken device or a, a device that was not uh, like new but had some more scratches was sent out to a customer which which is often that is kind of the scenario we really want to avoid uh, so we are showing that we can increase that yield um, from 60 percent to 90 percent with uh, the robotics just because the robotics uh, does an objective evaluation of the product compared to the very subjective um, human um, evaluation uh, oftentimes. That's, that's so a huge that's, factor, Georg, huge, because you're talking about a rapid ROI in those cases, if you can increase the yield that much, right? Exactly, and uh, are we also talking about the labor, labor aspect. So uh, the way that we look at it is we will actually um, enable each worker to be more productive by equipping them basically with a new tool, which is, is which is the robotics, which it's, it's, a, it's a tool we place in front of them and they use, they work together with the robot um, to, uh, so the robot does those, those very subjective tasks and brings the objectivity in, in it 
And so this worker basically becomes more productive, becomes more ob objective. Um, and uh, that also scales pretty well because one work, what we see in the moment with our uh, product in specifically, one worker could operate up to five of our robots. Um, so drastically increasing the productive productivity of, of each worker. Absolutely. And and Georg, let's let's go one step further on this and, and talk about um, it, it, it. It's the, the yield is is a factor um, and and productivity is a factor um, and you can show an ROI, but you can do that nicely with with computerization on digital products, perhaps like like cell phones. And I know that's the category you started. Um, I happened to witness a video of, of a garment uh, facility that processes millions of garments a year, and they are trying to do the same thing, disposition each and every one of them, which is a monstrous task. So right now, you've created robots that can look at cell phones, test them, and things like that. What do you think will be the next category that you'll be able to do that with, um, or the next couple categories, Georg? Um, that it comes down to a little bit what Rupert was talking uh, earlier, like where is the ROI? Uh, where can we find that that ROI? And uh, oftentimes it comes down to uh, the scale, like how many of that category of that product um, are, are you processing? Um, um, the smartphone industry is is uh, number one right now, um, and also how complex is it? Like how expensive is it today to uh, triage a, a a product of that certain category? Um, and so, how much can you basically save by by automating that or by having a robot assist you with the task? Um, so one uh, simple thing that that we're going to do is to expand to similar uh, uh, smart devices like smartphones, like go to tablets, go to laptops, go to smart watches, sure. go to maybe smart glasses once they they come. So we we are also looking right. already at the the AR and VR yes. uh, market. It's it's still growing, but it it, it has a big potential, we believe. Um, and uh, any electronics products uh, really um, in the future. I, I think a lot of the, the the attendees know that. I just, I wanna again emphasize, because we have such a broad community now, when you find a, a robot that can tell if a garment is good or not, I, I know people who will line up for millions of units to be processed, but that we'll come back to that one um, sometime. Thank you, um, uh, Georg. Um, let's come back to Rupert because uh, um, I, I want to be uh, uh, focused on this. This whole using robots thing is such. Uh, uh, I mean, people see it everywhere, um, but I'm sure there's a lot of attendees today saying, "I don't know how would we possibly get." A robotization project started, and Rupert, since you've done this for a while, I'll let you speak to that one first. Yeah, I mean, I've been in robotics now for thirty years, so um, and I've been involved in um, installing thousands of robots and at, um, you know hundreds of sites across the world. So um, the starting point is always the same. You know, as soon as somebody thinks, uh huh, um, you know. The, the robotics could help us. Um, we would arrange to meet them at their site, and um, we would then start talking through, you know, the issues that 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 they're facing, and we would start to try and build together with that that customer an understanding of, you know, what the existing processes are that they're they're, they're using. And you know how much cost is involved for them in in doing that. So we're basically trying to map out what 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 the the the, the start position is. Um, and then the next step would be to to try and look at um, ways at which we could improve that process through the automation, because um, one of the big wins of um, uh, robotics is we can re-engineer and improve the existing process using the technology. Um, so typically, 
customers who haven't dealt with us before, they don't want to do that. They, all they want is uh, for us to automate the existing process. And often they want us to automate the wrong part of the process. So, you know, we often go get asked to look at what they consider to be the most difficult part of their process rather than the part of the process which which involves the most cost for them. So we're our job is to um, find, you know, opportunities and to delight, you know, delight our customers with with the opportunities that we find to really um, kind of widen the horizons, think, you know, think out of the box and, 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 and find an elegant solution for, for, for the opportunities that they have. So, but that takes time and um, um, it's, it's a little bit like building a house. You know, what we don't want to do is roll up with the, the, with the cement mixer and the bricks and uh, we've got all of that. So the, the, the important part of building the house is, is deciding on, you know, doing the architecture to design, deciding, deciding on the design. So we go through an intensive phase of design with the customer, depending on the complexity of, of, of you know, the solution. So it, it, it could be for a small project, it could be very fast, it could ju be just a couple of meetings for a more complex project, it could take, take uh, several months to, um, to, to find the right solutions. Um, and as soon as the customer feels that, you know, the solution that we've, we've found is good, um, then, then we can cost it all out. And uh, during that process, anyway, we will have been sort of doing a, a rough calculation the whole time of what the likely costs are, are and we will be steering the whole discussion in, 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 a, in a direction where um, it's a feasible project rather than just a sort of, you know, just a, um, a, um, you know, a fantasy project. So by that, by the time we've done all of that, um, the customer should, um, you know, be confident that, that what's being proposed will add real value to the operation. And then, then we just, you know, um, then we go ahead and, 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 um to you know manage the project get started thank you rupert yeah. um your experience shows and uh clearly you, you've been engaged in this for a while and uh and 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 the uh the, the confidence with uh, your approach of of what you've been able to do and how it can be done in reverse um uh it it it, sh it shows as well so uh so sean we struggled um uh as an association to find companies uh, who want to volunteer that they're doing robotics and robots in the reverse space. And uh, uh, frankly, I think we mostly found uh, just the three of you companies focused on really these robot solutions and so on. So um, if, if you would, Sean, um, you, you're good at also giving numbers. What this robotization program, a startup uh, for one of our member companies, um, go ahead and t these are these are most of our, our guests, I'm sure, are new to automation. So what would you talk about as as the first steps as well here, the awareness that that we need to get out there? You, you know, from from my perspective or our company's perspective, we, we try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, and that's what led me to the company was the simplicity of the automation. Uh, we just we basically have a questionnaire that we could submit uh, remotely. Uh, it's a, a twenty question type questionnaire. I could walk the person through it uh, and let them fill it out, and then we in turn can take it into our social development group and do a concept and a order of magnitude pricing to see if it makes sense for the customer. Uh, talking about the simplicity of the, the automation, uh, we do a number of different scenarios where. Companies might uh, say, look, we're going to design to the two-year or the seven-year mark of our growth, or we might be thinking about acquiring a company and it might double the volume we have. Our, our technology is such is that it's uh, like a Lego uh, puzzle. You just you know, you start small and, and hit what your growth is going to be for the next 12 to 24 months. And if you should see, exceed that or happen to have a peak time or holidays that you deal with or something of that nature, uh, you could potentially rent robots as a service uh, to help expand and handle those growth, the net growth of those peaks and valleys uh, of your business. Uh, and everything's on casters for us. So for those companies that are smaller and they're uh, 
uh, concern that that might be require special electrical. It doesn't for our technology. Uh, there's no permitting or fire protection required because everything's on casters and it's considered furniture with the, uh, the fire insurance uh, industry. And uh, again, it's easy to repurpose. So you could start it in one side of your building if you're handling one particular customer or one type of product line. But you could move it over to the other side of the building to handle a different uh, customer or a different product line. Or you can use it for multiple sorts. So one could be a secondary sort and then use it for a primary sort. Going through the numbers, uh, again, you know, to Rupert's point, it, it, it basically start with FTEs and, and people, uh, but not being able to find people, what does that cost you? Are you losing business as a result of that? Uh, what's the accuracy like? Uh, you know, it's a question, uh, I think, believe uh, about uh, you know, the markings and the labeling and stuff of the product. So, it's right. uh, how you handle that. So. Well, and, and you, you referenced, uh, Sean, some of the intangibles. Um, what is it costing you that those returns are sitting on trailers in lot? Uh, because whether it's uh, electronics or whether it's fashion, the life cycle is very short on these products. And uh, the highest recovery is if you can get them back in the marketplace very fast. And, and that's certainly a factor. So um, let's come back to Georg. And um, Georg, um, I, I share information about the fact that I worked for Phillips for 25 years and uh, uh, they said to go out and figure out how to reduce returns and, uh, and, and deal with the exceptions. And our first use of robotics in a way, Georg, uh, was in the early 2000s where we set up digital cameras on the receiving line uh, because a problem that still exists today is what you get back is it what it's supposed to be and you're giving credit for it so there was a reconciliation being done by robotics primarily digital cameras you've come a long way since then your products not only can receive and confirm and validate but it then takes it a step further and confirms it as ready for sale um if you would wrap up um a, a few words on on other aspects of the uh, opto fidelity robotics that are out there that that you're making use of in in different reverse logistics spaces. Um, yeah, the uh, one thing you mentioned there, uh, the it's a, a one big factor is just the the massive amount of data that we can collect. That is also a big factor actually that also ties into the your return on investment is a little bit in untangible. It's right. it's harder to calculate it upfront like the the FTE savings is is uh, uh, like the other panelists said is is the easier uh, the low hanging fruit to calculate and that's also what our customers want to see. But then with the change to robotics, you get so much more value from that. And one big aspect is the the data that it uh, it's generating, and you have access to that data. Like everything that the robot sees or the the, the robot hears. Um, is going to be stored and it's going to be available as a data point later. So to your uh, example that you brought, uh, that is how our uh, robots are used today. If a customer re returns a, a product and claiming it has been uh, uh, delivered defective, we can actually go back and look at the picture when we send it out or when we when it went through the triage or when it went through the quality control um, before just before it was shipped out we have a, a literally a picture of that specific device before it left the warehouse and then we can um, uh, either dispute it or I confirm that yes um, that is a valid uh, claim um, and 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 there are many more aspects of uh, how you can leverage this data that was generated for, from robotics to help, for example, optimizing the flow, optimizing uh, the load of the, the products. Um, basically, like data, big data analysis comes into play once you go robotics. Well, and, and Georg, uh, all three, Sean, Rupert, all three of you are talking about things that help make returns processing more efficient. Georg, you're giving examples of, of data that can be collected, actually is being collected, we know, on individual people who may be more commonly, I don't want to say that they cheat or try to cheat, but returns are coming back clearly that shouldn't because these things work in many cases. We know the no fault found rates are still very high on electronics, and that's because people either don't know how to use this stuff 
there's that problem or they're purposely trying to upgrade themselves get away with sending a return that shouldn't be and the future really is about storing that data by person and and i hate to say it there's privacy laws that say that shouldn't happen but we know at some point you're going to get a message on your screen when you're ordering for example a pair of shoes from from nike and you've returned six pair in the past that didn't fit and they're going to tell you you ordered this size before it doesn't work for you something nicer than that i'm sure but the data you're collecting is critical for that information um and and we have to get into a mode at some point of, of how do we prevent returns? How do we stop returns? There's certainly a lot of invalid ones, but there's also some that are improper. So um, so thank you for mentioning that as well. Um, Rupert, um, a quick go, not quick, but a go around here now, if you would, a key takeaway from your experience to the community about robots in the reverse space. What would you say is a major takeaway you'd want everyone to know? I think that we're at the start of seeing robots in reverse logistics. I think um, existing in the past, the technology for conventional logistics has been very much geared to, um, you know, large quantities of the same item. Um, and, the, you know, there's a, there's a big, you know, there's a wide selection of, of people who are doing that. Um, reverse logistics with this, this need for to identify unique single items um, is 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 very different from that. And um, in uh, we're at the beginning of a new world where um, the technology has got to the point where we can we can you know break we we can move forward with confidence into in, in into um, these new applications. Um, one of the great additional points about about this technology is um you've got a hundred percent traceability of 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 your stock so not only does that mean that you picking up on what Georg was saying that you you, you can see you can analyze exactly um uh, what your processes um involve but it also means that let's say that you've got high value items so some of these mobile phones or you know um we're talking about you know well over a thousand dollars for a very small item um you, you've got traceability you can see who's touched that item you can it's it's a little bit like this 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 issue that you were mentioning tony about um you know controlling the, the quality of the, the the returns um unfortunately because most of the labor involved in um processing reverse logistics is transient and comparatively um, low paid compared to other um, 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 uh, other other tasks. Um, the temptation is unfortunately always there to uh, sort of enhance their earnings um, um, through maybe you know um, uh, sort of helping themselves to some of these high value items. However, this temptation gets dealt with. Um, very efficiently and very effectively by um, by having this technology, which can immediately pinpoint, you know, where um, where um, items have disappeared and who was involved in 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 that disappearance. There's a there's a very we were talking about the other non-related FTE savings. This can be a big item. The, the shrink issue is can 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 be a major saving. Um, Thank you. Yes, Rupert. Um, uh, Loss Prevention Research Council, one of our alliance partners, very focused on how to reduce some of those costs. And so thank you on that takeaway. Sean, um, add anything uh, on a takeaway side or anything else? I, you know, I, uh, I'm just pleased to say that the, the cost of automation is coming down. And uh, those companies that aren't doing automation, it's, uh, there's really a low risk, um, low point cost of entry uh, to get into uh, you know, using automation so you can either keep up with your peers or try to become a market leader uh, in what you're doing. There was also a question on um, what types of uh, you know, industries are looking at automation the most. Well, uh, there was somebody touched upon uh, the cell phone industry and they're obviously quite profitable and they, they have bigger margins and that is linked to uh, automation in a number of companies. But, uh, 
Also, those companies that are buying uh, goods uh, as a third party, but then by having their own, uh, whether it be a storefront or an e-commerce uh, storefront, and reselling these products to be uh, proactive in looking at that because, again, not uh, being able to find the labor to, to help process the uh, products. Thank you. And as, as we wrap up, I do want to acknowledge um, uh, we saw some good messages come in that I didn't pay enough attention to. I'm sorry. Um, Oliver Hedgepath from American Public University uh, talked about this program being good and wondered if there's any universities that are, are doing much in this space uh, uh, talking about it. And uh, Ryan Larson uh, offered a question about uh, that may, may be uh, uh, Sean or Rupert. Are there any industries uh, having more success than others with robots? Uh, Rupert, do you have a, a short answer for that? Well, I think the, um, you know, we, we've all mentioned this before that um, the mobile device uh, industry, um, you know, is, 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 is yeah. looking very closely at this because right. it hits a lot of, they, they have high volume. There's a lot of, um, people involved if it's a manual process the the value of the items is very high as well and um the 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 value added in having a fast turnaround uh, time is 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 there so um clearly this is a this is a good application of of, of the te technology um but um you know th there's there's lots of other potential sectors out there which um, have also been mentioned, like for example, the um, the computer components. Right. Um, that's Your one, attention. and right. um, anything which is you know the lot of the item coming in, and the value is is high is immediately going to be a market where where an activity where where robotization is uh, is, is 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 going to add great value. Yes. And uh, add to that, Tony, that the pharmaceutical industry for returns, they have to do lot tracking. They have to hold items of whether they're going to, uh, you know, they have to go to burn the product uh, after it's received back. And, uh, you know, narcotics and, and all kinds of controlled drugs that may be a, a big issue uh, that they're looking at in automation more and more. And, and that was a question that came in, and I was also going to throw that at uh, Georg if. Uh, if you have devices scheduled for that medical industry of uh, perhaps refurbishment of products and so on, is that happening yet? Uh, that nothing today. Um, I would love to get in touch with uh, those companies that process those medical devices. Well, we have a couple of them in the RLA and uh, we'll look for a couple of more. Philips, of course, is engaged with us and Siemens and others. So. Uh, I, I know we've run out of time, and uh, I, I will share these questions with the uh, with our panelists. Uh, there's a couple of others that came in. Um, David Lundberg had written, and uh, and thank you all for writing. Uh, I think we covered most of it. Uh, reading through the list of questions. So, gentlemen, um, thank you for sharing your expertise and advice on automation and robots in the reverse space. I think timing is great for this. I want to thank everyone that was able to join us today, and we will be back again next month with the Women in Reverse Logistics, month after that, possibly asset recovery, and we hope to see all of you at future events, including Sean, Rupert, and Georg. Thank you, gentlemen, again, for so much for sharing your, your information. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, all right. thank thank you, you Tony. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.